Great. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me uh, seven minutes, I think I have, to speak to you. So I'll try and condense what we've been doing uh, over the last couple of uh, years in seven minutes. And I know many people wish I would. So, um, How many people in this room have played with Lego this week? A couple, a couple, 20, I would say. So in case you don't know anything about Lego, we are the world's largest uh, tire manufacturer. Um, they're just really, really small tires. <laughs> Um, and over the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about one of the biggest changes we've undertaken within LEGO's history, I think is fair to say. And that's the challenge to move out of oil-based materials and move into more sustainable alternatives by 2030. Along the way, we'll employ over 100 people, we'll spend over £100 million, and we will build a sustainable materials centre in our uh, metropolis of Billund in rural northern Denmark. Um, and that will also not only find a technical solution to uh, the problem, we hope, but it was also engaged children, and I think you mentioned about uh, children, John mentioned about children, and certainly, um, and our motto or our value is about inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow, because we believe that the children who we work with day in, day out, they are in some way the global citizens of the, of the future. I don't know how to advance this slide, by the way, so maybe someone can help me do that. <laughs> I was just going to keep talking, it's fine. So, um, why did we do it? Um, well, first and foremost, it was, it's deeply ingrained in our values as a company. It's something, and everybody says that, but it's, it's definitely true with LEGO. From 1932, uh, we've had really strong values looking after people and the planet and, uh, and every interaction that we have. And reading the Connect book that Jim uh, advised us to do, or advised, uh, asked us to do, that they focus on the British chocolate manufacturers. And it's a very similar ethos around how if you look after your people and you look after the planet in some way, most things will come right in the end. So no, number one, our values. Number two, we had a little look at our um, impact on the world, and we found, surprise, surprise, that 75% of our impact was in our supply chain. 10% uh, in our operations, so we're one of the very few companies that owns and operates our own factories and making the, the uh, 19 billion Lego bricks that come off our factory every year. Um, and what we found is that 40% of our impact is in our bricks, and our CO2 impact, this is, in the supply chain and about 20% issues in the packaging. So if we really want to make fundamental change and, and produce sustainable materials, we can tweak our energy efficiency and we can install some new equipment and we can do some cool things with robotics, which we've done. But unless we start talking to the supply chain and talking to the suppliers of our raw plastic granulate material, so like little bits of rice that we buy in and heat up and mold bricks, unless we start talking to those guys, we're, we're gonna find it very difficult to make that, to make that change. So, oh, there's some lines there. How did we make the decision? So, we initially set the ambition back in 2012. And to be honest, a few years went by and we thought, ah, it's not really happening. We've set this ambition, we've done the talking, we've laid this really bold challenge. You know, we call it a bit of a moonshot. What do you want to do? Go to the moon. When? By the end of the decade. Really simple stuff in theory. Um, and so we found that not a lot was, was happening. And what we really need to do is do something to break the elephant into small pieces. It seemed like such a huge task to deal with. So we started and we did some uh, interventions on our product. We shrunk the size of our box by 18%, and that saves about 4,000 truckloads a year of uh, deliveries. We moved out of blister packaging into cardboard packaging on the bottom right here. And then we also ran a program called Design for Disassembly, where we removed metals from a lot of our um, products. This is a Duplo wheelbase, a preschool uh, product. And that improved the environmental uh, credentials by 20%, because it's all now recyclable in single stream, reduced the manufacture time by 50%, and reduced the cost by 50%. So by looking at this, yes, this could be possible if we, if we start to make some... Um, some real, uh, some real case studies. And we took those case studies, we pitched them around the business. We also had to demonstrate a track record for success and we'll open our first wind farm this week actually, on Friday this week. So that's uh, 300 million pounds of spend on our own wind farm op operated by Dong Energy and built by Dong Energy for us. And uh, John had a slide up from Dong Energy before. And then we locked ourselves in a room, we came up with a strategy, we pitched it to board and then we secured the <laughs> high-level support from the Oda family and, uh, and uh, all of our senior stakeholders, which sounds so simple. But it's all about timing, we found. It's, it's about getting all of the ducks in a row all at the right time. Any earlier, we might not have got the traction. Any later, it, it would have been too late to really capture the imagination. And we're very, very lucky that we have 
a board and an owner family for who this is incredibly uh, passionate. They're incredibly passionate about materials, particularly the new generation of owner family. They're coming in and they're saying, we really need to address this uh, issue on materials, on sustainability, all under our, uh, what we call our planet promise, which is one of four promises we make uh, around. We also make a people pl promise, a play promise, which is about the products we make, a partner promise, the people we deal with in our supply chain, and of course, planet promise, which is about positive impact. So, it's a huge task. We need to break it into some chunks, and these are just uh, uh, three of the chunks, and there are thousands of other chunks, and it's quite overwhelming at some point. It seems very simple as a challenge, but it's actually really, really complex to get an entire organization to fundamentally take something that was a given, we'll always use this material, ABS, into something that is not a given anymore, that is, is fluid. So how do you take that, that core part of your business model and turn it upside down? Um, and say that it could be made from anything. And what I would say to control the misconception, we're not going to be out of plastic. We're going to be out of plastic that comes from crude oil. So it could be any kind of uh, bio-based, uh, bacteria-based, unconventional carbon-based. We don't know yet. This is what we do. This is what we'll, we'll try and open the center in 2016. Um, and then at some point between 2016 and 2030, we hope to get to um, uh, our... Uh, Conclusion, um, I think a couple of lessons that we've learned already along the way, it's a huge task of change management, as you would uh, expect. We have some really, really high level aims and aspirations right at the top of the company. Just go and do it, make it happen. It, you know, we really believe in it, we believe you can do it, it's really simple, go and do it. And then at the bottom of the company, when you talk to our material scientists, it's, it's difficult, it's gonna take a long time, it's gonna cost a lot of money, we don't know how to do it. And what we're struggling with is how to bridge that gap between this very high level of ambition and this more rooted in reality, if you like. And I know that for some companies, it's, that's the flip reverse of that, that you have a lot of ambition at the, at the ground floor and, and perhaps not so much at the top. But in both cases, you have to try and bridge that gap. We have to be prepared to fail, which is difficult for us as a company to do. Um, we've had 10 years, 15 years of uh, double-digit growth, and we nearly went bankrupt, actually, at the beginning of 2000s. So, so failure is something that we, we wear on our, on, on our sleeve. And we need the time and space to achieve it. And I think that's my final point, is that it, sometimes change will take a long time, and, we, and it will cost a lot of money. And it's that old adage of wanting the three things. You want it uh, to be high quality, you want it to be quick, and you want it to be cheap. And sometimes you can only have two of those three things. And that's the challenge we wrestle with at the moment. Thank you very much. So if I can just start the process of responding, I mean, if you're going to succeed in this space, bankruptcies, near bankruptcies aside, it firstly helps to be Danish, uh, some great companies there, but it secondly helps to be family owned. And I think that next generation of family owners that are coming up now uh, are really, really interesting. And I think as a, uh, as a movement, we need to um, engage family businesses because very often they're uh, outside the... Uh, the, the, the spotlight, partly by choice. Tim, it's fascinating to hear you run through the, the, the level of ambition that you're, you're developing here because, you know, you, Lego ran into that sort of shell oil tanker uh, uh, problem with Greenpeace coming down on you like a ton of um, whatevers. Uh, and and um, the old order way of dealing with that would have simply been saying, so, you know, that, we'll, we'll drop the product uh, and, and then we'll just see if we can't sort of not talk about that again. But for, to jump from that and, uh, into completely removing crude oil from elements of your uh, supply chain, what an extraordinary uh, shift. Um, I have only one final comment to just pose, and it may come up in the later discussion, which is Microsoft have just been doing this ad uh, series where they I don't, don't normally get terribly wound up by Microsoft ads, but this has to do with young people. And it talks about in a particular group of young people, there's somebody who might in the future, and they start with, clean up the oceans. And it's fascinating to think how much plastic debris has gone into the oceans in recent time. And I don't know what Lego has been doing in that space. And I suppose most people cling on to their Lego bricks uh, almost like an heirloom. But I'd love to see Lego doing something in that space uh, as well. You probably are. But... No comment. <laughs> <laughs>
it's Tem coming. Tempting as it is to embark on this straight away, I think we need to move on to our second change agent. So we're going to move from uh, play to money, and I'd like to invite Kate Miller to come up to the platform now, please. Kate is the Head of Thought Leadership, Learning and Innovation at Barclays, and if that isn't an invitation of a licence to change, I don't know what is, as a job title. Um, post the financial crisis, Barclays has clearly signalled the need for change with its CEO, and I think Kate's going to highlight one of our key tools that Barclays has developed, which is called the Lens. So, Kate, give us a clear Although view of the I Lens. I think I've just disconnected. I think you're on. I'm on. Okay, great. I'm not sure what the cord's for, but there we go. Um, thanks. Oh, no, I don't, I don't know slides, so that's fine. You can hear me. Oh. Go. Great, thanks. Um, so I uh, am going to talk a little bit about an example of how we're working at the other end of the spectrum. So in addition to bringing together senior leaders and starting to think about um, big, ambitious and iconic goals that we can set for ourselves as an organisation into the next phase of our citizenship strategy, in parallel we're also doing quite a lot of work looking at how we can really influence and challenge the kinds of day-to-day uh, -day decisions that we're making as a firm. This work's been going on for a couple of years now. So it started also um, back in 2012, um, which for those of you who follow financial services know was a, a particularly tumultuous year for us, particularly for Barclays. And off the back of that, um, and as we're absorbing things like the, uh, the SALT's recommendations, we were seeking to understand how we could start to bridge this disconnect between the expectations that our stakeholders were setting and, and the kinds of commercial decisions that we were making every day. You know, why was there this misalignment and what, what could we do to resolve it? Um, What's come out the back of that, there was a, a significant review that was undertaken to understand, well, what's causing that? What is it in our commercial decision-making processes which are designed to be, to be efficient, to be making good decisions? Where is it that actually we, we, we've got this gap? Um, and, and what came at the back of that was the Barclays Lens, which is a, a decision-making framework that we've rolled out globally. Um, it's, uh, there's, there's brochures actually, I, I won't do slides, but there are brochures on your, um, on your table if you'd like to have a look. Um, and it, it's a set of questions that we're asking colleagues to be, to be applying to the commercial decisions that they're making every day. Um, a, a universal set of questions, and you'll see if you have a, a quick look at the brochure that, um, that th they're fairly common sense. So it's about um, how are we making a profit or a cost saving? How are, we, how are we engaging with our stakeholders? Uh, how are we creating value for the long term? How are we creating a win-win? And is this the right thing to do? Which on the surface of it could seem to be fairly straightforward questions that actually you'd hope that we'd be making, that we'd be asking ourselves in any instance. Um, where it gets more complex actually is often in the prompt questions that sit beneath those headline questions. So they might include things like, for the how are we making a profit, is this level of profit likely to be viewed as fair and reasonable by most? And this is actually where you see that you could open up an enormous debate and discussion internally. Um, what is fair and reasonable? Who sets that test? Are we holding ourselves to industry norms or accepted practices? Um, who is by most? Who are the stakeholders for whom it's critical that, that we are landing and, and closing out that disconnect? Um, these questions have been rolled out globally um, and it's not a compliance rubric. You're not plugging in data and, and a, an answer of uh, you know, red, amber or, or green, it pops up for you. So it's about generating discussion internally um, and allowing colleagues to use the framework to actually start to challenge some accepted practices within the firm. So what, what we've seen is that as well as embedding these questions into uh, the formal decision-making processes, the terms of references that we're using. Um, actually, it's opening up and creating a new kind of conversation. Um, it, it's part of a, a broader learning framework, which includes uh, things like the Leaders' Quest experience, um, where we're allowing leaders to take time out of their day to, to actually set aside that space to discuss with their peers about the role of banking, 
the role of Barclays, our responsibilities to society. And that, I think, is... Um, it may seem like a, a, a small thing. Actually, it's, it's having an enormous impact. Uh, having your most senior leaders take two hours out to actually stop and say, let's have a discussion about this, and I would like to shape an import into the way that we factor these uh, considerations. Um, it's having a real ripple effect across the firm. So we set a target originally to reach around 400 um, key leaders and decision makers, um, but quickly found that wasn't enough. So what our senior leaders were doing is they were coming out of that training saying that's a conversation that we need to continue as a firm. Um, and as a result, we're adding, um, adding to the workload of the, uh, the small sustainability team by nominating whole lists of, of their senior leaders or their businesses that they wanted to participate. So from the original list of 400 colleagues, we've now reached around 7,500 um, through this face-to-face -face training. As well as the training, in terms of the kinds of outcomes um, and different results this is producing, it's enabling, as I said, colleagues to, to really um, start to have a conversation internally about, about our impacts, about the, the social, environmental and ethical considerations um, that we're factoring into our decisions and the kinds of outcomes we expect to produce. Um, it's also allowing colleagues at every level of the organisation to flag concerns. So where something may have seemed like accepted practice and the junior colleague might not have felt conf confident to come forward um, and, and raise something that's been going on for a long time, actually this has given them a framework to say, well, how does the lens apply in this scenario? Um, and it's also really producing different kinds of outcomes. So we're already seeing within the last 12 months the kind of outcomes and decisions that we're taking as a firm at a transaction level, um, at a business level, at a market level are markedly different, which is really exciting to see. Um, in terms of the, the next steps, where do we take this? Um, the, the conversation is very much at, still at the beginning, so really agreeing as an organisation where we land on these complex issues, how far ahead we want to sit of regulation of the laws that are applying to us and, and the kind of um, uh, involvement and stance that we want to have in sectors um, that don't align with our values. But the next step and the priority for 2016 is really to start to build on the momentum internally um, and to allow colleagues to start to explore question four uh, a bit more deeply. So this is where we're looking at how can we produce a win-win for, for Barclays, for our customers um, and for society at large. Um, and rather than the decision or the transaction being the starting point, as in how can I incorporate ethical considerations or, um, or resolve ethical um, complexities in this issue, actually have the societal issue be the starting point. How can I design a product or a service or an outcome that's going to respond to this issue? Um, thinking about how we can create shared value and, and really start to, um, to build a different kind of outcome. It looks like I'm getting the, uh, the time's up, so thanks very much. Thank you, Kate. And I, and I think what you were touching on there is something that every organization has to tackle, which is how do you get the right conversations happening over time? And I think one of the chocolate makers in this country were referenced a moment ago, and as most of us know, the, a number of the, the major ones had Quaker backgrounds, as, as did Barclays. And I think what I take away from the, the Barclays saga recently has been that even with the best intent, uh, organizations can drift, their, their values can change. And in a period of sort of turbo capitalism, as some people uh, uh, have exp uh, described it, the pressures intensify. And the question I, I, I would raise for you for later on is, it's great to ask the questions and to hold people's uh, almost uh, feet to the fire. And, and the question of critical mass is, is a big one. So is 400 colleagues enough? Clearly not. Is 7,500 colleagues uh, enough? Well, it sounds like a lot of people, but if you're really going to change the needle, it's got to be everyone in the organization. It's got to be everyone in the supply chains. And over time, it's got to be the customers as well. They're really going to have to uh, 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 drive you. And I, I, I suppose my one concern here is that the way you're going, it makes a bunch of sense, uh, but is, 
any ambition, that, is there an ambition there to automate the process to some degree? Uh, probably not. But I think the human element of all of this remains absolutely critical, that, that, that people respond to other people. And, and if the challenges come from NGOs or, or other people, that they can have a bigger impact. But it's, it, it sounds a fascinating approach, and I'd love to know more. Thank you, John. So we'll leave that for our panel discussion. I'd like to invite our third and final speaker onto the stage, uh, Richard Gillies, who's the Group Sustainability Director at Kingfisher. Many of you will know him from his time at Marks and Spencers, where he was absolutely at the heart of the birth of Plan A. Uh, but for the last two years, he's been at Kingfisher. So tell us about your journey about change that. there. The journey between Marks and Spencer and Kingfisher, we'd need more than seven minutes, I think, for that. So we, we won't start with that. But I think what we... Um, I have got the advantage of going last, which is brilliant, because now I can pick up on what other people have said on top of what I was planning to say. Um, and for me, in terms of the title, which is The Art of Change, um, I'm going to resist the temptation of doing the public relations thing for Kingfisher's net positive program, or indeed try and lay claim to everything that Marks and Spencer has done in the last 30 years. Um, what I'd like to just talk too briefly about are some lessons that I think as, as sustainability practitioners, certainly I have learnt, moving from, if you like, a practitioner, my last job before I entered sustainability was a procurement and construction director, moving from a pure business practitioner into a sustainability professional, where all of a sudden the billion pound budget and the 250 people I had at my disposal disappeared. And yet the challenges I had and the task that I had to deliver seemed to be on a scale of difference enormous. Could you just sort out everything and the world and all its ills and here's your four pound 50 budget and your two full-time equivalent. So you can't go about it in the same way. So for me, it doesn't say Kingfisher net positive, it says integrating environmental and social responsibility into all we do. How do we make it real in the business for real people? Not for people who are paid the luxury of being involved in sustainability full time for an organisation. And I know it doesn't feel like a luxury and I know it feels like a difficult journey, but for many of us this is a luxury. It's something we're passionate about and we get to do it all the time. So, Kingfisher, not the beer, not the airline, you know what it is in this country, it's B&Q and it's Screwfix, but we're a home improvement retailer. 1,200 stores, 12 billion pounds, etc., etc. Our mission, and we're gonna talk about purpose a little later on, is to make it easier for our customers to have better and more sustainable homes. So there's a customer-facing outcome there that says it's our job to assist people to have better sustainable homes. So there's a purpose. Question, how many people in the organization can articulate that and feel that in what they do in a daily basis if you work for Brico Depot Romania and your job is to buy toilet seats? Do they really understand how that purpose translates to them? I would suspect not. How do we integrate sustainability into all we do? That's the journey for me because all the challenges that were faced and John, on John was... Um, frame them extremely well at the beginning, we as sustainability professionals will never know all the answers. And we'll never know all the answers for somebody who buys toilet seats in Romania. Therefore, what we have to do is get to a position where that person can bring all their skills and passion to bear to be able to articulate and deliver what it means for them in country. So there's two things I want to talk about. This is a bit of a wordy slide, but it goes, does go back to the World Economic Forum. It goes back to the Consumer Industries Group which developed a version of this model, but it's been extremely useful for me to be able to help people understand where it fits. So everything above the line is the bit that my mum, and many of you have heard me talk about my mum before, uh, the bit that my mum sees. She doesn't see supply chain, she doesn't see forests, she doesn't see palm oil, she doesn't see packaging, she doesn't see logistics, she sees nothing but the things she buys. So how do I make it real for her? How do I make my mum's life more sustainable? How I deliver products and services that allow her to have a better and more sustainable life. And they're the things that product development and our people who are developing the proposition need to be thinking about. Below the line, efficiency, productivity, supply chain resilience, supply chains, all that stuff, but not to talk to customers about. We did a thing in Marks and Spencers, and I'm sure if my colleagues from Marks and Spencers here won't mind me saying, we believe a rainforest is too high a price to pay for a biscuit. 
Now, you're all sustainability professionals, so you understand the reference to palm oil. My mum recognised high price and biscuit. It's not her job to understand some of that stuff. And for the mass, mass market, the mass majority, we have to do that job for them. So this works extremely well. It's very easy to talk to colleagues in the bottom half of our world about logistics and supply chain and energy. Carbon, four pound a ton or something. Diesel, about 120 pounds of it I need to burn to generate four pounds a tons worth of carbon. That's already in the operating plan, that's already there. So you must, must continue to work and speak in business language. In terms of resilient supply chains, Timber's our biggest raw material, an area the size of Switzerland we keep quoting. I'm not sure we've ever quite measured that as accurately as we would, but an area the size of Switzerland. That's extremely important to us as an organisation. Do we treat it as a strategic raw material, or do we just buy paintbrushes and somebody else has to buy the wood for the handles? Yes, we're almost 100% certified now across all our companies, but do our colleagues understand why? I was in Poland, window frame, FSC, it said on it. Do customers in Poland understand FSC? I said to my colleagues on the sales floor in Poland. No, no, they don't, no. But we'd been really helpful. We'd, re we'd written responsibly sourced timber next to it in English. Somebody was just ticking a box who bought window frames in Poland. We got the right answer, but we didn't get the right answer because we're not going to get any innovation out of that person who's buying window frames in Poland. They just keep sending memos about how FSC is more expensive, which you've all had, so you'll recognize those. Where are those opportunities for new, new, um, new products? It's really interesting, actually. We're doing lots of stuff in the run-up to COP. It's in Paris. Our biggest businesses are in Paris, are in, are in France. But it's really interesting to start getting my colleagues to think about product promotions on LED light bulbs in all our businesses during the period of COP. How do you get customers to engage in a way of reducing their energy bills when it's topical in the news in a way that's relevant to them? Because they can't do very much about unilateral agreements. And then also preference. We've seen what we've seen with, um, with Volkswagen, so we don't really need to go on to that. We, we can't really afford not to be in this space. And businesses do understand that, and examples like Volkswagen are really important. So the model's really important. What I would also just say, it's about people. And I went into Kingfisher, and I went to see some of my colleagues in different countries, and I was scratching my head how they quite, didn't quite understand what on earth I was on about. Why don't they think like me? Why cannot they see that there is only one route and the business opportunity is enormous? And you suddenly realize that they haven't had the privilege of traveling all over the world to go to slums and factories and hear important speeches and go to Cambridge, and they just don't have that privilege. So let's give them it. This is the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. That's a little ice cube with some 400 million year old. But that's the logistics director from B&Q, the logistics and supply chain director from Screwfix, the same from Turkey, the commercial director from Romania, and the rather grumpy bloke with his arms crossed is, is, is our IT, one of our IT directors. Funnily enough, you share the information that you all know, and these rational, sensible, intelligent, articulate, well-educated people start to move into your world. We have a wonderful example where I sent one of my colleagues who's the, a director doing a piece of work on reinventing the garden category for Europe. So b and is the biggest garden centre in the UK, 10 million bedding plants. We can give you a lovely case study on removing peat from bedding plants. But actually what's more important is that she's responsible for reinventing gardens for the next 10 years for all the Kingfisher companies. She stood up in front of the board a few weeks ago and told us that she wanted to aim for chemical-free gardening. If I'd done that, they'd have thrown the beardy CSR wonk out of the window. They didn't. She said it. They questioned whether it could be done. She said probably not, but unless we set off with that ambition, we'll never get there. So for me, a huge part of what we've not got to do, what we've got now to do is to start to educate our colleagues. And I read, happens to bizarrely read a quote today that um, Winston Churchill had accused, or as attributed with, that um, um, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. So I'll finish with that.
Well, j j just very briefly, I mean, you underscored the importance of meeting people where they are, real people, real world. Your mum, I mean, I, I'm sure she's a, already a reference point for most people in the room, but, uh, you know, a, a few, few, few more recruits on board or, 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 uh, this evening. But it does strike me that the ideal outcome of all of this is not to have people think every time they buy a material, they sort of go into the bank, in a sense, this should be assumed. This should be part of the quality, this should be part of the trust mark, um, but we are so far from that. And every uh, new scandal shakes our confidence in the system as a whole, not just in, in, in particular sectors or uh, players. And in, in that context, I think your point around education is fundamentally important. There are many people who think this is so urgent, we probably don't even have the time to educate people. I think it's the most important, greatest, longest, term investment that we uh, severally make. You, met, you mentioned Cambridge and, and uh, they've done great work in terms of business education. But I think that one of the critical challenges that we face in the next five to ten years is completely transforming business education itself. It's amazing how many faculty members in business schools and so on still do not get this. And yet uh, about five years ago I was at Wharton School and the dean came up to me and he said, what people like us are talking about this evening, it's still an elective, it's still an option. He said in 10 years, he probably would now say 15, uh, it's going to be what we teach at business schools. But that's not going to happen on automatic. How do we push them in that uh, direction? But thanks for all of the work that you've all severally done in this space. That's certainly one thing that I found across a range of different MBA programs in the UK and one reason why I like the Exeter One Planet MBA mm. program because the entire program is built around the idea that we only have one planet. But one thing you alluded to in your keynote was this idea of enormously challenging goals and targets. So you mentioned both Interface Floor with their Mission Zero yeah. and the fact that they achieved those when at the beginning it was perceived to be a completely sort of ludicrously pie in the sky ambition and then of course famously Unilever doubling through halving. But Richard you mentioned at Kingfisher this idea of having some very big big target so a, a BHAG a big hairy audacious goal um, and Tim you alluded to that in Lego as well so tell us a little bit more about the the role of goals and targets in in norming in setting the agenda internally in the company. Richard, do you want to go first? Um, I think as I was there at the, the birth of Plan A, I would be a uh, very passionate supporter of targets. Not because I think they're the end in themselves, but in businesses, unless you've got some targets and some timelines, then things can drift and drift off the agenda. And um, the challenge and the more time I've spent working in you know, two businesses with two or three different sets of targets over time, the, the key is the ownership of those targets. Those targets are no good, actually, if they continue just to sit in the C-suite. It is how do people in the organization who actually have the responsibility to do things internalize those targets and come up with the solutions that you're going to get there. But I would struggle, and it might be just be the way I've worked through this challenge, I would struggle to see organizations not at least beginning the bottom half of, of, of John's diagram without some form of targets. And I do think um, the sort of every little helps, every journey starts with a big, a small step. You do have to give people the confidence to begin to see that they can do it. And when they do do it, the whole world doesn't fall in on them. And those little steps, those initial steps, give people the, oh, well, yeah, oh, bit further, bit further, and then the, the braver people get, and they, the more likely they are to move into that and the business is more likely to be able to accept and absorb that transformation of change that you referred to. There's a lot to be said for actually giving permission, isn't there, by setting those big targets. You're effectively signalling to everyone yes. in the organisation, you have permission to try this. Um, we may not have the roadmap, we may not know exactly how we're going to get there, but we all have permission to try. And there, there's another approach which isn't a sort of big bang, super Tesla, high ambition, which is geared more around the idea of having metrics so it's more specific metrics and targets at a lower level. And I wonder if in some ways that's a, that's a sort of slightly cat flap approach 
to sustainability. So you don't go for the big bang, but you go for the, the stealth, the stealth introduction. And I wondered when uh, listening to you, Kate, talking about the lens, this trying to change the conversation in Barclays, so not making it something mandatory or compulsory. How does, how does that feel to you as, a, as an alternative approach? I mean, I think targets are incredibly important, um, both because they sustain organisational commitment over time, um, but they, they also allow us to um, compare ourselves to, to our peers, um, to respond to stakeholder expectations in areas where we might be falling behind. So um, I think that the, the work is very much in, in parallel. Um, where we see the kind of the greatest amount of bravery being exhibited is when our um, our leaders and, and colleague base are able to be involved. And I think that's been a lesson that we've learned from the past. Um, that small sustainability teams you know, working away with a CEO's office might come up with very ambitious targets, but they might not have the buy-in that is going to enable people to not only just seek to meet those targets, but to exceed them. Uh, and so that's been something that we've been building into our process at the moment, is, is really how can we spend the time to get all of the organisation behind this inputting and feeling ownership before we've even gotten to a launch of a, a new commitment. I think one, one thing I would say on, on targets is really that I don't know if everyone in the organization needs to understand the target completely. They don't need to understand it in its minutiae. But they do, if they're given what you talked about, metrics and cap flaps, they, they need to understand why they have those and on what we're trying to drive. Otherwise, you get um, strange behaviors coming out and, and, and sometimes moving in the wrong direction. So I think the big challenge is if you set a 100% renewable energy target or you set a 2.5% energy efficiency goal, is then to really, well, why is this important? You know, why are we trying to move in this direction? Oh, well, it's about money, it's about uh, reducing our risk, it's about um, uh, saving the climate, it's about all of them, actually. And, and, and pick which one works for you, you know, pick which one you're most excited about. Um, but try and get to as many levels of the organisation as possible and, and, and make that messaging simple, which is why we use a lot of alliteration, so planet promise, people promise, partner promise, etc. People get that alliteration within the business. And then they can hold that and keep it with them as a simple way to remember. Yeah, yeah everybody I know, and, and we're not a huge business, we're only 15,000 people, but everyone knows planet promise. They don't maybe know what it actually needs to do and what it's about, but they know it's something about the environment. And they know it's something about using less of and using in a better way. Um, but yeah, the, just the, we call it, you know it's internal branding at the end of the day. Yeah, one of the things I loved about your seven minutes was that you used the F word. You talked about being prepared to fail. Mm. So that's the the big unmentionable, isn't it? In in sustainability circles, this being able to um, acknowledge that failure is a possibility. And if we're here tonight to talk about the art of change, change inevitably involves two sides of the coin. One side is progress and success, but the other side is failure. Uh, and two organisations that I've worked with, one in the public sector and one in the private sector, it's been fascinating to see how in both of them it was very difficult to talk about failure. And if you can't talk about failure, then it's very difficult to learn. And one of those organisations has now changed completely and has things called uh, failure, failure fests and failure fairs, where people come and exchange and learn. So having learnt from that failure, it can never happen in that way again. And I find that a fascinating uh, understanding that this is a good way to learn, to acknowledge the failure and embrace it. And you work with a whole range of organisations that take enormous risks, some of them. You highlighted some in, in your presentation. So have you encountered this differing approach to failure across some of those real ambitious shooting for the stars organisations that you reference? Well, well hugely. And I, I was just thinking in terms of Denmark. Um, we started to work in 1989 for Nova Nordisk, you know, much admired. Uh, company, but when we first went in, uh, their president, Mads Olison, said they had had a, a really ugly experience some years previously where Ralph Nader had really gone for them as, as a company in terms of uh, biological ingredients or bi biological detergents and the enzyme components of those. And, and, and Mads Olison said, the, the natural human instinct is to bury failure like that. And he said, I, I don't want to wallow in it, but um, 
I've kept it live for people, and I, 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 I ensure that they remember, because they lost something like 50% of their business in the space of a few uh, weeks. They had to lay off hundreds of people in, in, in a then not a huge company. And, and he made sure that that uh, pain lived on in a constructive way. And I think people who can do that are firstly remarkably rare, but it's actually a, it, it can be the precondition of a, of a, a learning culture that, that, that can really embrace some of these bigger themes and, uh, and deal with them sensibly. So this issue about the, the art of change, it's very interesting, the title tonight, it's not, it's not a science. This is something that needs to be quite flexible, quite nimble, um, quite adaptive, quite quickly, which you alluded to in, in Lego's response. They had to adapt and learn quite quickly in order to embrace that change. Um, and that idea that a lot of that is going to involve uh, becoming more resilient, and that involves doing things like building in redundancy which is a slightly different way of talking about the way corporations function, where we've been very good at efficiency and strength in supply chains. Um, and the idea of redundancy and being able to be slightly more nimble is a very interesting reinterpretation of actually being strong and being able to make progress and reach your targets. And Richard, you've done that journey, or you're in the process of doing that journey in a big way for a second time. So what can you tell us about the, the learning that you've done there? Well, I think redundancy, first of all, is a scary word in a business context because people use it in a very strange way. Um, I think for me, the, the, the issue tends to be that, that in the retail environment, we're not particularly capital intensive. So it's not, you've not got big legacy systems. That, so you're not, you don't have that sort of longer term view that manufacturing industries have. You're reasonably responsive. Um, and therefore, the sort of redundancy and stranded asset really doesn't, strike you in the way that it can other industries. Um, I think where you can become redundant is in your product proposition. And your product proposition and the way that you go about serving your customers is extremely prone to those market interventions. And we've seen it in cars, we've seen it in hotel rooms, we've seen it in taxis, we've seen it in all sorts of things. So what does that look like in the home improvement sector? Because for all of you in the room, when you walked around B&Q with your mum or your dad, 10, 20 or 30 years ago, you walk around now and, and you would recognize it 20 or 30 years later, where many other industries have changed almost beyond recognition. So what does home improvement look like in the future and what will be those disruptions be? That's where redundancy becomes difficult because you're looking to find and be the market destroyer or the market recreator that you've never, you've never previously been. Um, for me, what's quite interesting, though, is, is where people get the stimulus from that. Because one thing I'm quite nervous of is the sort of streaming of news and information. So if you read my Twitter feed on my phone, I follow all of you. Um, and, and, and therefore, my phone sounds like the world's going to end and there are lots of great, exciting things happening. And then I look at other people's news feeds and they don't say any of that. And I'm thinking I've got a 24-year-old son and a 22-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old son, and they don't see any of that at all. What's happening to Manchester United? What's happening on that thing where you lose partners by flashing it left to right, whatever that? There isn't a news feed about the kind of information that I'm getting about the world. And if I look at one of my colleagues at B&Q, she does a great job of sort of doing an assembly of news feeds each day, which she now circulates to a much wider audience than just the sustainability community because I was conscious that the sustainability community were there again, making ourselves even more anxious about everything that was going on in the world, and even more enthusiastic about the breakthroughs that were being made, means while all my colleagues with those big budgets and big people were immune to that. And so again, I think for, for us in the sustainability community, it's how do we share the love? How do we share that information? How are those Twitter feeds? How many people in this room are not working pretty much full-time in sustainability. Probably not that many. No, you see, there's a few nervous hands going up. Where are all those supply chain directors? Where are all those product developers? Where are all those marketeers? Where are all those finances, financiers? Um, they're not here hearing what John had to say. So the anxiety that is reinforced in my gut that makes me want to go and do it more tomorrow isn't there with the audience that I have to go and sell to. So for me, there's a real danger that we understand the redundancy, we understand the threat, we understand the new market introductions, we understand that we lost two stores in Antibes and Nice 
on Saturday night because it rained a lot. I'm not sure my colleagues in Antibes and Nice know that potentially more extreme weather is part of the future and there's something we can do about that in terms of resilience and the kind of things we sell to customers. And that for me is, is, is the real danger. Although, although we find, we're finding more and more that colleagues uh, are worried about these issues and, um, and it, it's something that keeps them awake at night and they're thinking about the future of their children and, and the planet and they're doing things in their own capacity. What they're not necessarily doing is making that connection and bringing it to work because they're a you know, currency trader um, or they're a relationship director uh, who, whose job is to, to support clients to have financial products and they're not actually seeing that. So that's really a significant part of the learning agenda is helping people understand, you know, I don't, when I talk about citizenship, when I talk about sustainability, what I don't want you to do is to go away and create a, an employability initiative for young people. I want you to look very carefully at what your team do and the impacts of your role in your segment or your business and start to make those incremental changes because that's where you'll have an impact. I, I also wonder, I'm, I'm not totally convinced it's all about education. I think it's a big part of it. But I think if you talk to any child now, and even people of my generation, we grew up with some limited environmental education. I had the Blue Peter Green book, which was my prize possession at the time. <laughs> so I think we are aware, and I think a lot of people are aware, but it's not in their Twitter feeds because it's not interesting. It's not engaging, it's not exciting. And that's where I'm really passionate about engineering and some of the more technical solutions because I find them super fascinating, super cool. You know, how can we get this brick that's molded to, to you know, less than the thickness of your hair, two nanometers, and, and how can we find a material that's just as shiny, holds its color just as well, is as safe, is, sounds the same when you mix it, um, builds in the same way, can be taken apart by a five-year-old's uh, hands, you know, how can we answer all of those questions? For me, that's really cool, and I want to try and share that with other people, because I think it's not all doom and gloom. The problems are doom and gloom. The, the issue is real and it's serious, but the solutions do not have to be hair shirts and doom and gloom. Tesla are by far making the coolest cars out there. And I think any of their engineers would, would agree that this is a super fun and exciting and cool place to work. Um, so I, th I think education is, is part of it, but creating the pull as well as the push is really important. Absolutely, which is why the work that I'm doing at the moment on um, this program called Living the Dream is all about changing the narrative on sustainability in the UK to make it populist and accessible and fun. So you completely change the, the approach rather than, as you say, starting with the problem, you start with the solution and you just integrate that. Now I can see some hands up in the room already, but before we hand over to the audience for you to um, question our panel, I'd just like to ask each panel member, just invite one final pithy comment for your top insight for the group tonight on the top tips for the art of change. It can be about enabling criteria, the power of champions, power of targets, whatever you like. Uh, starting with John. Oops. Well, um, <laughs> when Jim first told me that the art of change was going to be the theme this evening, I, I, I picked up a book on the creativity of artists and the, the common characteristics of painters and sculptors and musicians and so on. And three of them stick out in, in, in my mind. And one was that they never fail. They're always learning from things that go wrong along the way. Second is, obviously they're creative people, but they're always learning from the past. Now Picasso for years painted in the old way until he suddenly broke through in a, in, in, in a particular uh, vein. And then uh, they're entrepreneurial. And I think one of the things that worries me about this space at the moment is that we're, we're obsessed with entrepreneurs like Elon Musk, but the question is, are we ourselves being entrepreneurial enough to really drive the sort of change that we're happy to talk about, but not always knowing quite how to deliver? That wasn't that pithy, but it was an attempt. Thank you. Tim? Um, make change fun and interesting. Uh, I guess it's a bit like moving house. It can be an absolute ball ache if you want it to be. Um, and I'm sure it is for most people, but it can also be interesting. You're moving somewhere new. That's exciting. You're going to meet some new neighbours. Hopefully they're not too terrible. Um, you're going to have a, a great a new house. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. And can we make change more appealing and exciting and, uh, and uh, fun? Thank you. Okay. Um, I think mine would be, um, and this is something that we talk about a lot internally, is uh, if we want to create change, we need to uh, stop relying on precedent. 
So we need to stop looking back and relying on decisions that were made previously to inform the way that we take things forward as an organisation because essentially we could be building on, on shaky foundations. So it's about looking forward, thinking about the kind of organisation that we want to become and, and essentially trying to start with a blank sheet. So avoiding precedent would be mine. Interesting. Thank you. Richard? Um, I think we have to make it real and we have to make it real for the people we want to drive that change in their language. And that oft times is not the language that we all talk every day. <laughs>